pipelines here. So biotech is not something that most of you are going to be very familiar with right now, but it is a very, very content heavy topic. Um, there are four processes that you do need to know in uh, pretty significant detail. And one of them is PCR. So if you've ever done a PCR COVID test, um, you're going to learn the process as to sort of how that happens. Um, biotechnic sorry, biotechnology in general are any sort of um, technologies, machines, processes, analytical techniques that help us understand biology and human genetics in better ways. So biotech has huge, huge um, applications uh, in terms of, you know, sometimes really simple things like diagnosing diseases and sometimes much more uh, significant things like curing diseases. So for any of you doing your research investigation, if you're doing things like um, gene therapy, genetic screening, uh, genetic, any sort of genetic treatment, CRISPR, um, cloning, any kind of meddling around with genes are known as biotechnologies. Um, so some examples can include like, you know, use of penicillin as an antibiotic. Um, some more complicated examples are, you know, gene therapy, where you're literally cutting out or replacing a gene in an organism to treat them of a genetic disease. Um, there are four main uh, important kinds of biotech that you guys are needed to know. The first one is um, how to make recombinant DNA and plasmid biotech. The second one is DNA profiling. So that's where you, um, like it's used in forensics, where you take a sample of a DNA and then take a sample from a criminal and see if they match up. Um, DNA sequencing. So that's where you... Uh, are able to identify what the base pairs are in a certain genetic code and like map out, oh, there's, you know, this many adenines, this many thymines, etc. Um, PCR and gel electrophoresis. So this is going to be a lot of content. I will say it's like the best way to learn biotech is kind of to take it slow. So try and absorb as much as you can during uh, this lesson. Um, but I will say, if you've got access to the recording, definitely come back to it because uh, I'm going to kind of fast track you through um, five different kinds of analytical techniques. Uh, so hopefully I don't overwhelm you guys. But as always, I can't really slow down because you're watching a recorded lecture. But if you need some further clarification, let me I'll try my best to make it happen. So first one that we're going to do is recombinant DNA. Sorry, just give me a second two seconds so I can start writing and recombinant DNA um, if we want a definition of it is taking DNA or taking a healthy gene from a different organism organism and in putting it into a new organism. So you might have heard um, like genetically modifying plants with uh, pest resistant genes. They've taken those genes from, you know, bacteria or other organisms that have developed a resistance to the pest and then inserted it into the plant genome. So basically they're taking foreign DNA and putting it into an organism to make it uh, a little bit more healthy. And basically the foundation for recombinant DNA are these little rings of DNA that are found in bacteria called plasmids. So... Our plasmid here. A whole bunch of bacteria are farmed and extracted, um, whether plasmids or the DNA that aren't like in nucleosomes are used as sort of like transport vehicles to transport DNA into other cells. So our first step is isolation. And that is where you have something called a target piece of DNA. So this is the genetic um, code for the 
actual gene that you want to insert. So this could be like, I don't know, an antibiotic resistant gene. It could be a heat resistant gene or something like that. This is cut using something called an, a restriction enzyme. So this little tiny protein is engineered by res researchers and cut out of the original piece of DNA. Let's say that the antibiotic resistant gene was in a um, I don't know, a small worm or something like that. They take the worm's DNA and use the restriction enzyme to cut the code for the gene out and separate it from the, the rest of the organism. So restriction enzyme is used to cut the target gene. Um gene. Now the start and end of the restriction enzyme are called these recognition sites, recognition sites, which basically identify like, oh, this is the start of the gene and this is a point where the gene finishes. Um, there are two ways that a restriction enzyme can cut a target gene. The first one is straight down. So if you take out the little piece that it's cut, Let's say that there's like, I don't know, an adenine here, thymine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, etc. And then it's flanked by G, C, T, A as the finishing recognition site. Now, that can be cut straight down. And if it is straight, as in like the gene looks like a rectangle once it's cut, this is called a blunt end. And sometimes, like the one that I drew in red, they'll be cut in sort of this shape with like a bit of an overhang. So like the target gene will go from here to here, and then they have an extra A, T, G, and like, I don't know, G, C, A at the very end. These are called sticky ends. Typically speaking, sticky ends are a little bit more favored because um, once we insert it into the plasmid, there are, the plasmid will then bond to the little overhanging bits and like provide a T, A, and C, and alternatively a C, G, T on the other side, so that they stick together really, really well. Kind of think of it as like piecing two Lego blocks together versus piecing two wooden blocks together. Because of the overhang and because of the... Um, Oh, because the overhang allows the pieces to fit really snug against each other, this, the adherence is a little bit more strong. So in general, sticky ends are preferred. Here. Anyway, step number two is plasmid preparation. And this is where we take that plasmid and we use the same restriction enzyme that we use to like harvest the target gene DNA to cut a little section out of the plasmid DNA as well. So the restriction enzyme, the same one. Restric hello? Oh, whoops. Restriction um, enzyme cuts the plasmid. And this then becomes a plasmid vector. The, plas uh, the, the target gene, which I'm going to code in red, by the way, is then inserted into the plasmid vector, and it should fit snug against each other because they were cut using the same enzyme. If it's a sticky end, the base pairs at each of the ends will actually bond together and cause a very, very snug fit into that vector. Um, this now becomes what is known as a plasmid vector because the target gene has been inserted inside. Step number three is, oh, I don't know why it's light blue. Sorry, I wanted it to be the same blue as before. Step three is ligation, where the isolated DNA and the prepared plasmid are now combined and basically, so here's our original plasmid. And on this section is the start of the target gene on, oh, sorry. 
Oops. On this section is the end of the target gene. DNA ligase, which is another little enzyme, another little handy enzyme, glues the two of them together to make sure they're super snug. And then finally, the... Oh, okay, so once this happens, there are some of the plasmids that combine with the target gene um, very, very successfully. Some of them, though, don't. They just reject the target gene and end up dying off. Um, to In like real life, to check that they have been successful, what will actually happen is an antibiotic gene will also be inserted into the plasmid vector. Um, is inserted. And I'll talk a little bit why, um, I'll talk a little bit why that is significant in this next one. Sorry, just give me, oh, two seconds. Oh, there we go. Hopefully you can see me there. Oh, so now that the plasmid vector has fully been prepared, um, we need to test whether it's been successfully, like the target gene has been successfully inserted or not. So just as a little um, recap, target gene is in, uh, cut from the host DNA or the foreign DNA. Same restriction enzyme is used to cut the plasmid vector and it's combined with the plasmid. So once the DNA ligase comes in and everything's glued together, it turns into a recombinant plasmid where it's got a foreign piece of DNA inserted into it. Then what happens is, if my PowerPoint slides are going to work, ooh, there we go. Then what happens is the bacterial chromosome will be put into a solution and heat shocked. So the temperature is like raised really, really high and it encourages the bacteria to start growing and produce the code for its growth. Um, what we then see is the solution of the heat shock bacteria is to be placed on a petri dish, but the petri dish is antibiotic. So the only bacteria that can grow in there successfully are the ones who took the um, antibiotic resistant gene from the plasmid vector. So all of the colonies that end up growing are the ones with the correct plasmid on it, and they are then harvested and then sent off um, as the successful plasmids to um, make use of the gene that's been inserted in there. So the gene then starts creating the protein from the um, inserted piece of the gene. So, sorry, the plasmids then start making the protein from the target gene, and those proteins are harvested by researchers who then go off to do all sorts of things. Um, and so the, yeah, the final step of recombinant DNA is something called bacterial transformation, where they undergo a heat shock. Um, the successful recombinant plasmids die, sorry, the, res the successful recombinant plasmids are able to grow on an antibiotic dish and the unsuccessful ones end up dying off. Those that were successful are collected and then used for protein production. And, okay. I just realized I had to flip my screen around even though I just got it off. Or, no, I can just teach you off this. So DNA sequencing and DNA profiling are slightly two different things. DNA sequencing is our ability to map out the base pairs um, of a DNA sequence, so the mixture of you know G's, A's, T's, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. DNA profiling is the ability to compare a known sample of DNA against an analyzed sample of DNA and see their differences. So DNA sequencing happens by um, running a sample of DNA. So for example, here is the, um, oh, sorry, I'll get my laser pointer. There we go. Here is our sample of DNA that we want to copy. In order to sequence a piece of DNA, you need a lot of copies of it. Um, cause DNA is really, really small, right? You want to get as many copies as you can. So you can kind of, it, it becomes more of a physical substance. So the process used to copy DNA is actually PCR. We're going to go into that uh, very, very shortly. So stay tuned for that. But 
um, the gene that you want to sequence undergoes PCR, which causes a lot of copies um, to come about. Then what happens is that each of the base pairs are dyed with a specific color. So guanine in this example is dyed with a yellow color, um, adenine is dyed with a green color, uh, cytosine is dyed with blue, and thymine is dyed with red. And all of those dyes are fluorescent. So once exposed to a particular light frequency, they can glow. What then happens is that the sample of the DNA that is now dyed um, undergoes through uh, undergoes a couple of like molecular processes before being run in gel electrophoresis. Gel electrophoresis we're also going to talk about in a little bit more detail, but um, essentially that process separates out all of the pieces of DNA so you can see um, each of the different components within it. The small fragments of DNA get pulled very, oh, this will make more sense when we talk about it later, but the small fragments get pulled a very small amount. The large fragments, sorry, the small fragments get pulled a very large amount. The large fragments travel a very small distance. So suddenly you've got all of these sections of DNA from the target gene that are now in more digestible sections. What then happens is after they are separated out, the scientists will run a laser beam through the sample of the DNA and all of those fluorescent dyes that we were talking about there start to glow. And so you use this thing called a chromatogram, um, which shows like, okay, the first um, base pair that the laser came into contact with was an adenine. And so you get this, oh, not an adenine, let's say it's a thymine. And so you get this spike of red that comes up on the chromatogram. The scientist can read that and go, okay, it's a red dye, which means our first base pair in the sequence is a thymine. The second light, the second um, base pair that the laser comes into contact is also red, so it's another thymine. Then you might get a yellow, which means there's there's a guanine there. Um, another red, another thymine. Blue is next, so it's a cytosine, and so on and so forth. So the more that the laser runs through the sample of DNA, the more um, of the fluorescent dyes start glowing, and the more that the researchers can identify this particular color aligns with this base pair nucleotide. And then once the entire dye has been lasered through, they can put together each of the colors and find out what the base pair sequence is. So this allows us to look at exactly the um, sequence of base pairs in each of our gene and map out our genome. The human genome was mapped out through something called the Human Genome Project. And so we've successfully been able to um, get all of the sequences for all human genes, which is quite a quite an impressive thing to do. Um, because of that now, we can kind of break down like, oh, this gene codes for this particular protein, which results in this disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's really, really helpful in like diagnosing uh, genetic disease diseases. So the dye process is called DNA sequencing. DNA profiling, I will come back to, but I just want to go through polymerase chain reaction um, first with you all. Um, so, PCR is the process that we use. Give me two seconds. I've got notes that I'm looking at, and the PowerPoint slides just stopped responding. Anyway, PCR is the analytical technique that you might have heard of with um, COVID diagnosing. Now, in order to perform that process successfully, they take a sample of your DNA that's either like um, a bit of your mucus from your nasal tract, or I know some people have done cheek swabs as well um, with saliva. Um, there is only a very small amount of DNA in those samples that they take, and in order to correctly diagnose you of a disease, you need a much larger sample of DNA. Um, and so the thing that lets us facilitate that is polymerase chain reaction. Um, as you can see from the slide, the purpose of PCR is to make millions of copies of DNA sequences when only small samples of DNA are available. 
Um, I've done PCI I think twice now, once in first year uni, once in second year uni. It takes about, I mean you can run it for as long as you want, but we ran them for about three hours. And um, even after three hours, like we had this tiny little test tube that was, you know, similar to the the size and thickness of my like stylus here. And even then the only DNA that we could see was like a small, like it was literally the size of the pen tip. There was a very, very small amount of DNA. And supposedly that was around, you know, multiple millions of copies. Um, the more you run it for, you can run the process for as long as you like. Um, within uni, we were only able to run it for two to three hours, but um, the more you run it for, the more copies that you can create. It doesn't really expire as a process. Um, and so you might notice a couple of similarities between DNA PCR and DNA replication, if you remember that process from the start of Unit 4. Uh, but basically, the first thing that happens is you take your target gene or your sample of DNA um, that you would like to copy. So this is the target DNA sequence of interest. Now we know that um, in terms of you know DNA, there's a five prime end and a three prime end, and um, that DNA, sorry. Um, Whoops. Uh, that copy of DNA is then going to go through something called denaturation, which is basically a step where the sample is heated to a very, very high temperature, which causes the hydrogen bond bonds between the um, bases to break apart and then separate the two strands out. The second step that happens is called annealing. So annealing is where the temperature is then decreased. And then this enzyme called TAC polymerase, that's T-A-Q polymerase, comes in and starts, um, sorry, not TAC polymerase, what am I saying? Annealing temperature is decreased and then these RNA primers bind to the original copy of the DNA. So kind of like um, DNA replication, there's a priming step. Extension then happens where the temperature is then heated again and then they run this enzyme called TAC polymerase into the solution. So that's TAQ polymerase that binds onto the primer molecule. So this purple strand right here and starts copying the target gene by adding like free nucleotides. So it does the exact same thing. All of the adenines paired to thymines, guanines to cytosines and so on. And then at the end of extension, you've gone from one copy of DNA to two copies of DNA. And then basically, immediately after this cycle finishes, it re-goes through the whole process. So denaturation happens again. The um, strands will separate out once again, but instead of one copy, you've got two copies being created. Um, annealing will happen, which causes the primers to bind onto the strands, and extension will happen where TAC polymerase goes and copies it in again. And so by the third cycle, you've got two to the power of three or eight copies of DNA being made. And you run it through as many cycles as you need to get two to the power of N copies. So the pre PCR product that ends up happening is each time that the DNA is replicated, it gets broken apart again and re-replicated. Um, it's quite a fast process, honestly speaking, and uh, very, very useful in getting multiples of D multiple copies of DNA uh, quickly. Now, some useful applications of PCR, these are the ones that you're required to know. Number one is diagnosing any sort of genetic related illness. Um, number two, analyzing uh, crime samples found, like either DNA or blood samples found at a crime scene um, to amplify and then analyze them in forensics. Number three, uh, potentially extract and amplify small amounts of DNA from fossilized remains. Um, so we can look at DNA relationships between organisms. Um, so yeah, you might have heard that humans and chimpanzees share 99% of their DNA. That was only discovered because of PCR, the ability to amplify them and then run through, through tests. So PCR by itself um, is actually not too useful because it just creates multiple copies of DNA. In order to understand the similarities and differences between these DNAs, we use a process called gel electrophoresis. Now, if any of you are also um, chemistry students, 
you would know that gel electrophoresis is um uh sorry an analytical technique that's that's used in both bio and chemistry but in dna what they do is they get this really really jelly-like sheet it's made out of agarose jelly if you've ever done agar plates um and on the end of the agar plate are all of these little holes uh, called wells what you can do is using a pipette you can um insert a small sample of dna into each of these wells and then you set it into a electrophoresis chamber the liquid that you see there just reaches the top of the well you'll actually do this experiment it's a mandatory crack um so you can see it in action but uh, basically the liquid is set just on top of the well and it's like a, a buffer solution so it's like a salt it's got ions in it and then on the ends of the plate are electrodes so a positive side and a negative side what they basically do is they load all of these samples of dna into each of the wells and run a current through it um and because the salt solution is able to conduct electricity the current moves through the entire well DNA um, as a molecule is positively charged. And so as it runs through the current, the molecule will be attracted to the negative side of the um, agar plate. So all of the um, pieces of DNA within these samples will start moving to the negative side. Once this happens, the small molecules, because they're very, very light, will travel a really great distance. And the larger molecules, because they're more dense and heavy, will travel a smaller distance and you end up separating them out. So I've got um, very dense molecules on this side of the plate and then very light molecules on this side of the plate. What they'll often do is take a sample of DNA so and put it on the first um, rung and then another sample of DNA, put it on the second. The more similar bars that they have, the more likely the DNA is the same. So if this was like a crime scene, for example, um, and this was, you know, the suspect's uh, DNA that they had gotten from somewhere, and then C was the sample found at the crime scene, because those two bands are very, very different, the pattern of bands are very, very different, it's very unlikely that the suspect is the person who actually did the crime. Whereas if those bands were matching up, like one for one, you, you've got yourself a match. And um, there are a lot of forensic applications that you can use gel electrophoresis for. So the uses of gel electrophoresis are determining um, parental testing um, paired with like DNA profiling. Second thing that you can do is um, GMO testing. So genetically modified organisms go through this process to um, see if their genes have been inserted properly. Sometimes you can test out champagne with gel electrophoresis and also um, polygenic inheritance identification. So lots of applications. Now, DNA profiling, which we saw here, is the combination of you getting a sample of DNA, running it through PCR, and then running it through a gel electrophoresis to, com uh, to compare a known sample against a found sample. So that's what DNA profiling is. Um, which brings us to this question. Now, DNA profiling, came up in the 2021 exam, which is what I wanted to go through with you guys right now. It was in a short response question. So this is paper one. If you are, um, if you are asked to write the three components of a DNA nucleotide, this one is a unit three, like early topic one question, but a nucleotide has a uh, sugar, which is deoxyribose sugar. Covalently bonded to a phosphate group. And the sugar also has a nitrogenous base. Now, to get the one mark that this question is worth, you do not need to draw the nucleotide. You just need to say those three words on there. Now, describe the steps involved in DNA profiling. So DNA profiling is where you compare the similarities and differences between a known sample of DNA
against an unknown sample. So for example, if you have a blood stain at a crime scene, and then you're able to get a suspect that, you know, could have been the criminal. <laughs> and then if you're able to collect a sample of blood from that suspect and compare it against the crime scene, being able to identify similarities and differences can be done through DNA profile. The first step is to identify these things called STRs or short tandem repeat sequences, which are bits of DNA that are common to every human. They're um, common genes that everybody has that repeat very, very quickly. Um, so by identifying them, they're probably the easiest point of comparison because there are so many similarities and they're a very like common type of genetic sequence. Step number two is to amplify the copies of, of DNA through PCR and up like run that for a couple of hours until you've got multiple copies of it. Step number three is to run the amplified copies through gel electrophoresis. So gel electrophoresis and um, find similarities and differences. Like so. So that is DNA profiling in a nutshell. Those are the um, steps that are required of you to answer that question properly. And it's basically one mark per correct step. All right, give me just a second. Whew. All right, that is the end of our biotechnology uh, topic in terms of content. But there is one cognitive verb that I want to run through with you guys just before we go on to evolution. One of those last uh, dot points in the syllabus is your ability to appraise a biotechnology technique um, on its success rate. So. The actual verb of appraise is actually very unnecessarily complicated, but there is a certain way that QCAA wants you to answer these questions if you do ever get an appraise question in your external. The first thing that you need to do is determine a measure of success. So if you were asked, appraise the ability for genetic screening um, to improve effectiveness of diagnosis, for example your measure of success might be the time taken to complete the diagnosis, it could be the accuracy of the diagnosis, it could be the um, severity of the diagnosis, like whether or not it's able to catch the disease at a like, less severe time or whether or not it's like kind of ineffective with its method. So I've got other examples here, growth rate and then percentage completion could also be your measures of success. Your second step is to identify a treatment group and compare it with the control to see how successful the technique is. So you take it, um, you take that technique that you're trying to appraise and compare it against a technique that's already used and see are the accuracy levels higher or lower, are the times higher or lower, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then finally, make a conclusion about the future use of the technique based on the success. So whether or not it's actually better than the techniques that are already used or whether the previous one was better, so the new technique should just be scrapped entirely. And so anytime you see an appraise question, these are the three steps that you need to put into your question answer to get it correct. All right. Um, oh, sorry, I'll just plug my charger in to the laptop. Um, in terms of bioethics, Biotechnologies are a little bit invasive because you're directly dealing with, you know, people's genes and things like that. So there are a lot of um, 
policies put in place to protect people who are going through like biotechnology trials and things like that. Um, these are things that you could be considering in your IA3 if you're talking like gene therapy and cloning in particular, um, but it's not something that will be assessed in your external. So 